so um, I'm actually uh, going to start by going through the syllabus. So I should say um, I usually say that on the first day I'm not going to go the whole time because there is no reading to discuss. I made a note to myself last year that I actually did go the whole time, uh, so that it may not be true, but anyway, that's the plan is not to go the whole time. Um, so I just want to, now can people read that? Okay, I assume that means yes. Uh, yeah, we can. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so my plan is just to go through the syllabus and administrative stuff and then give a more or less brief introduction to what the course will be about. So this is my course's page. Uh, there's a link to it on the syllabus, uh, and there's a link to the syllabus on it. <laughs> um, and here's the syllabus. Um, so... Now, why is that still happening when I, didn't I mute everyone? If someone unmuted themselves and is making noise, please stop. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, how to contact me. Um, the best way to contact me is usually email. Um, I, I usually, I don't check it every second. I usually check it at least a couple times a day though. Um, if you need to um, reach me more quickly than that, like it's um, an emergency or something, I have this thing set up. Now I'm not 100% sure it still works, but let me refresh this. Oh, here it comes. <laughs> Right, this is my daughter when she was much younger. Um, so basically if you sign in with your UCSC account, which is a Google account, um, it should know that you're in this course. And then you can uh, send a push notification to my phone with a short message. Um, I mostly, I set that up at a time when I used to be really bad about checking email. I, I hope it's not necessary now, but I'll still try to get it to work. Um, as I said, this is a link to that courses page I was just on before. This is the Zoom link. Um, so the first two weeks are going to be only via Zoom, obviously, as the whole university is doing that. Um, after that, the plan is to uh, be in person, but uh, obviously we're going to have to see what happens. <laughs> um, so, um, but in any case, whether it's on Zoom or in person, I'm, I still plan to have a Zoom feed available and also to make recordings and post them on YouTube. Um, and there will be links. Uh, there will be a link to the YouTube playlist. I guess I'll add one to the syllabus. There'll be one on the courses page, and there'll be links to the individual lectures after the right. So, like um, after I put the recording of this lecture up, there'll be a link here to the YouTube recording. Um, So that gives you multiple ways to possibly attend my great lectures. Um, let's see, course description. I'm going to talk about that more later, so I won't say anything about that now. Oh, office hours. I should have mentioned that, right? So my office hours are definitely going to be only by Zoom until further notice. Uh, you know, it's possible if the situation really improves by the end of the quarter, maybe I'll have in-person office hours. I don't know. Right now, definitely not. But um, the Zoom office hours, there's Zoom links here. If you can't make that time, uh, just let me know and we can make an appointment for a different time. Um, okay, course requirements. So there's basically two assignments, a midterm and a final. 
for both of them, you have a choice between a take-home exam and a paper. And these assignments are already up, and there's links to them here. So, um, right, they're both the same length. The difference is that the take-home exam, you have a choice of questions, essay questions, and you have to answer two of them. Um, and uh, I think of that as actually easier than writing a paper, right? Because I've act, you know, because to write a paper, you have to come up with your own question, basically, <laughs> um, and explain why it's an interesting question, and you know, uh, figure out how to structure your answer to make it convincing and so forth. Whereas to answer an essay question, I already told you it's an interesting question; you just have to answer it. Um, however, I I have the paper alternative uh, for people who want to do that, especially if you're thinking of uh, applying to grad school or whatever, it'd be maybe in your interest to write a paper, um, or if you just you know really want to do that. Um, I'll talk more about those assignments uh, when it gets closer to when they're due. And they will be available, they're already available online. Um, the, so the assignments are online on my website, but, um, but you hand them in using Canvas. So, um, you know, there's two assignments on Canvas. One is called midterm assignment and the other called final assignment. And whether you're doing the, the exam or the paper, you just hand it in using that. Um, please do not plagiarize. Uh, I've been having, I used to basically say just what I just said, please don't plagiarize and go on. I've been noticing more of it lately. Um, so I feel like I should emphasize it maybe a little bit more. I don't know if it's because of the remote learning or what, but in any case, please really don't do this if you, you know, if you find if you find you have to copy or paraphrase something from Wikipedia or whatever and put it in your assignment, okay, that's not great. But you know, put that's not a great way to write an assignment. Obviously, it would be better if you had your own thing to say. But if you put a footnote, you know, then it's not plagiarism. And although I can't offer any absolute guarantees, I, I have never failed an assignment that someone actually handed in. So, I mean, where unless the only reason I've ever failed an assignment that someone actually handed in is if they were, if I discovered they were plagiarizing. So you just, you know, um, uh, it's better to write to, to just put in a footnote. And I guess maybe, I feel like everyone should know this, but maybe peop some people don't, I don't know. It doesn't help if you change some of the words a little bit. <laughs> it's still plagiarism. It, 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 plagiarism. If it's clearly the same text with just some alterations, um, it's still plagiarism. And um, I, mean, I was gonna say something else. Oh, and if you run it through a plagiarism checker and it passes the plagiarism checker, but you know you copied something from somewhere, then that just means the plagiarism checker didn't work, right? So, I mean, if I find the source anyway, I'm, you're not going to be able to say, oh, it passed the plagiarism checker. And I'm mentioning that because I got, I've gotten that response a couple of times recently. Um, Oh, so there's some questions in the chat. Is the exam option only two essay questions? Yeah, you choose, there's like, well, I mean, there's, I, I forget, there's like five or six essay questions, but you only answer two of them, yes. Graded based on the two assignments, that was the other question. Yes, grade is based on the two assignments, 50% each. Here it is. Each of the two assignments is worth 50% of the course grade. Um, 
So what that means, by the way, is that attendance at lecture is not required. Um, uh, I strongly recommend it. I, I think my lectures are helpful. I actually just lynched, listened to the audio from all the lectures last time I gave the class, and I was like, hey, this is actually not bad. <laughs> so I think my lectures are, are helpful, and um, so I, I definitely recommend coming, but I'm not going to take attendance or anything like that. Okay. Um, so there's these four required texts. Um, this one, Karl Popper, The Logic of Scientific Discovery, is available free online through the library reserve page. So uh, unless you want a physical copy, you, I, you should probably do that. Um, the other three are on reserve, at physical reserve at McHenry. Um, and uh, uh, and you, you can also buy them through the uh, Bay Tree Bookstore through the, I guess the new system is now online for doing that. Um, uh, or, you know, there's the ISBN here if you want to buy it somewhere else. Um, Um, and I, I also put these two other books on reserve at McHenry. Um, I'm going to be, especially the Popper one, I'm going to actually refer to a few times, quote from it, uh, but it's not part of the required reading. It, but, it, you know, I, I, they, they, they're actually really interesting, so I put them on reserve in case someone wants to look at them. Um, and there are some readings that are not from those four texts and those will be available on canvas. I haven't put them up yet, but I will soon. Um, and is there anything else to say about this? This is just the list of readings. As this footnote says, this symbol means section. Two of them means sections. Okay. And that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Are there any questions about any of that stuff? Any more questions? Okay. Click the browser. Take some load off the CPU. Okay, so the title of this course is Philosophy of Science. So first I'm going to say a little bit about what that is. Um, so uh, it's not history of science or sociology of science. Um, that is, uh, it's not some kind of, I guess, empirical study of what science is. It's something else, it's philosophy of science. So, um, so the history, I mean, I guess to understand why there is such a field as philosophy of science, I think it's useful to understand the history of the relationship between philosophy and science. Um, so, you know, um, as I'm sure you know, philosophy was, uh, Western philosophy was originally written in Greek. And for about the first thousand years, it was almost all in Greek. A little bit of Latin later on, right? And there's a Greek word. Episteme, right? Which you uh, probably familiar with from the word epistemology. Uh, episteme, the Latin translation of episteme was scientia, right? That's the traditional Latin translation. Um, and, 
uh, um, what is it in Arabic? Ilm, I guess. <laughs> anyway, after philosophy was in uh, uh, stopped being mostly in Greek, it except in. Byzantium, where they still did it in Greek. Um, it was mostly in Arabic, and then really kind of later than that, mostly in Latin. Um, so all the Greek terms, you know, got these traditional translations. Scientia is the Latin translation of episteme. Um, in English, we translate the, the ancient Greek word episteme sometimes in some contexts as knowledge and in other contexts as science. And same for scientia. Right, so like Aristotle's name for physics is he fusike episteme, the physical science is the way we would translate that. Um, uh, but on the other hand, when people talk about the difference between knowledge and opinion, let's say, that would be episteme and doxa, right? So it's, um, um, so it can mean either science or knowledge. Um, and uh, the important thing for our purposes is that it was not used to mean something distinct from philosophy. On the contrary, right, Aristotle is one of the, you know, uh, um, founding figures of Western philosophy, and he wrote this book called, well, actually, it's not called, it's called On Things Heard of, About Physics or something, but anyway, um, he, he wrote a book about physics, He Fusike Episteme, and uh, that was a branch of philosophy. Um, so, um, philosophy and science were new, not two different things. There was a physical science, there was a science of what Aristotle called first philosophy, or p a later people called metaphysics, um, uh, but those were both parts of philosophy. And, um... They were both like philosophy in this sense, like current day philosophy, or at least when it's good, I guess, um, in the sense that um, if you studied Aristotelian physics, you would, one of the things you would have to, to try to understand is what is physics? What is the definition of physics? Why do we do physics? Um, so, um, in other words, it had that, um, element of self-knowledge, which is essential to philosophy. Um, it was also like the other parts of, uh, I guess maybe I should, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So, right, so, so that was, so there was a kind, oh, and I guess I should say one, one other thing. Although Aristotle and Aristotelians following him often talk about someone called a logician or a physicist or a metaphysician, right, that is a specialist, there, for the most part, weren't such people, right? Just like Aristotle, the philosophers in antiquity and the Middle Ages, mostly the, all these specialists were the same people wearing different hats. So there really was no distinction there, but it was part of one common project of increasing our doing something with our knowledge, our episteme, or science. At the beginning of the modern period, and right, I mean, by the modern period, I mean what we call modern in philosophy, namely starting around Descartes, or maybe Machiavelli, according to some people. So um, at the beginning of the modern p period, um, people started to notice 
that there was this new thing going on. At first they didn't call it something different. They called it philosophy or experimental philosophy or natural philosophy or something like that. But um, two things about it. Number one, it was making uh, incredible progress in a way that no one had for the last 2,500, well, the last 2,000 years, right? All of a sudden, um, you know, Galileo and Newton um, and their followers were able to make these amazing predictions. If you look in the sky at a certain time, during a certain year, there'll be a comet. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, so this amazing progress that had never been made before in all the years of, of philosophical physics suddenly was happening. And something that I think took a little bit longer to notice, but people did notice it. Uh, I mean, again, even before our current terminology existed, I think you can see people like Descartes and Leibniz already starting to notice this, that the people who are making progress in physics in this way are not doing philosophy, so to speak. They're not philosophers. For example, um, if you ask them what physics is, they may not be able to give you a very good answer. Even if they can give you a good answer, that's not part of their professional responsibility. Right? I mean, again, that was something that was, I think, a lot less clear at the beginning, you know, with Galileo and Newton. It was, you know, they still kind of um, gave new explanations of what physics is and things like that. But that had turned out not to be the interesting part <laughs> of what they were doing. And pretty soon people working in what we now call modern science were clearly doing something that is not philosophy. But they were having huge success where philosophers never had success. Um, so this, as, and as I said, people were not 100% um, clear that this was the issue right away. I'm not sure we're, we're still that always clear that this is the issue, but, um, um, but it, you know, it caused a crisis in philosophy. So the question was, why? Are these people who are doing something that, I mean, I guess like one way to you could put what I was just saying about the difference between modern physicists and Aristotelian physicists is that modern physicists don't know what they're doing. <laughs> That's what it can seem like to philosophers. And it can still sometimes seem that way to philosophers, that the physicists just don't know what they're doing. They can't give you a good explanation of, you know, why they do the things they do, N not one that would satisfy a philosopher. So, um, and yet, uh, clearly in some sense, they know what they're doing much better than we do <laughs> because they're making all this progress and we're not. That, you know, that's the, those are the basic terms of the problem. I think there were, um, there were and can, continue to really to be two responses to this problem. So I guess I'm gonna erase all of this. And the first response was Philosophy should become I'm put light in parentheses. Philosophy should become light or should become science. That's one response. Um, and so, you know, starting really again before people are even 100% aware of this issue, I think you already see starting with Descartes and definitely with Leibniz, 
um, and um, Locke and Hume, uh, people saying, um, um, okay, you know, the experimental philosophers have had great success using a new method, and we have to learn from their method and use their method in what we're doing, whatever that is, philosophy. Right? Or, I mean, at least we have to somehow learn something. There was a trick here that we have to figure out how to do. Um, and as Kant famously put his aim at the beginning of the Critique of Pure Reason, he says, I'm going to put philosophy on the sure path of a science. So from now on, philosophy also will start to make progress the way what we're already realizing is it's, you know, has become a separate field, physical science, the way they're making progress. So whatever we're doing will make progress. The other response, and so these responses are, you know, they're not, they don't contradict each other. And a lot of people do both of them <laughs> in some combination, but there is definitely a tension between them because the second response is something like, Okay, what's left for philosophy? Right, meaning, um, all right, we've learned that philosophy is shouldn't really be in the business of trying to understand the motions of the planets. Um, other people who are not really philosophers are going to do that better. What are the things that modern science can't deal with that way that, that will still have to be done by someone else, namely us philosophers. Um, so, uh, um, right, that is to try to understand what the limitations are and, you know, to, to say, well, there's certain things you can do really well without exactly knowing what you're doing. But um, when it comes down to it, there's some things, and people usually say it's the most important things, right? But anyway, there's some things that you just can't do that way. You know, so like Leibniz says, it, it, would, it would be a mistake for a physicist or a geometer in the middle of... Um, a demonstration or experiment or whatever to suddenly stop and ask how is it possible for there to be a continuum um, composed of extensionless points. Um, uh, he says that would be as much a mistake as if in the middle of a important deliberation about what to do, I were suddenly to stop and ask, wait, is there such a thing as free will, right? Is it that it's, it's, it's not just unnecessary, it's counterproductive, actually, he says. But on the other hand, he says, in the end, if you want to understand why there can be such a thing as physics or geometry or decisions about what to do, then, you know, you can't ignore those things anymore. And then you have to pay attention to what you're who you are and what you're doing, basically. Um, so, uh, so both of these responses pretty much lead philosophers to be interested in science, right? I mean, the first one requires philosophy of science, meaning it requires that philosophers study what's now being called science, modern science, you understand why I sometimes add modern science because I just pointed out there's always been something called science or episteme um, since Aristotle, since before Aristotle. Right? Um, so, uh, but what we call science appears to be something new. Modern science. So, um, so right. If if you if you take this approach. 
philosophy should become like science or should become part of science, should become a science, some, some variation of that, then obviously that means philosophers are going to have to study science to see what the scientists are doing so we can learn from it. And on the other hand, when you take this approach, well, it's maybe not as absolutely mandatory, but chances are that as part of that, you're going to also want to understand what scientists are doing, why it works so well, in order to figure out what the limits of it are. Right. So, um, um, so both of these approaches lead to philosophy of science, namely philosophers trying to understand science. Now I haven't said what philosophy, I haven't said what modern science is either. I just said something about what it did, uh, but we're gonna spend the whole course talking about people's views on that. But um, I haven't said what philosophy is. I think when, when I teach the, when I've taught the intro course, I usually start by saying um, um, that you might expect an introduction to philosophy to begin with a brief explanation of what philosophy is. But then I say, but unfortunately, that's actually one of the hardest problems in philosophy. <laughs> so we can't begin with that. So, but I have said a little bit about it, right, in saying some of the things that make modern science not philosophy. Um, um, but the truth is that in the presence of modern science, part of the answer to that question, again, given either of these approaches, part of the answer to that question is going to go by way of trying to understand what science is. We want to understand either in what sense the things that we're doing that we call philosophy whatever they are, are, are kind of a science or part of science, or we want to understand what science is and why what we're doing is different. Okay, are there questions about that so far? I would definitely love to see people ask questions. Um, but, uh, um, yeah. Professor, you mentioned um, so like how science, modern science, was more successful than philosophy. But by successful, do you just mean in making new discoveries about existence and the world around us, or? Like well, so it's actually that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, so it's, I mean. I think, um, on the one hand, it was just clear to everyone that they were doing something really well. <laughs> um, but exactly what they're doing really well, like what is the definition of success according to which what they're doing is successful? So again, um, if you ask scientists that question, um, you don't necessarily get a very satisfactory answer from the point of view of a philosopher. It's a philosophical question. <laughs> and we'll see that the people reading this course disagree about it. About what the, what the progress of science, in, in what direction and in what way it's making progress. Again, I think it was... It was just clear that no one had ever done the kind of thing that Newton did before. And that a lot of people would have wanted to if they could, <laughs> right? So, so in that sense, it was clear that there was some kind of amazing progress, but, but, it, but in more detail to try to explain what that is. Is it really good for anything? Is it useful? Is it, you know, I mean, all those questions are, are um, are open for discussion, both in the early modern period I was talking about, but also in the authors we're going to be reading. Is that, is that um, sufficient yeah, answer you. for now? <laughs> yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, so, uh, right. So the answer, so the, 
I've been making a distinction between the early modern people and the people that we're going to be reading. Um, uh, so, uh, so I guess the moral of everything I was just saying before is that ever since the rise of what we now call science or modern science, um, there's philosophers have started to do something that could be called philosophy of science, trying to understand science. But the discipline that today is called philosophy of science um, with some exceptions, but not many. Um, I think it might be time to get a new whiteboard. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know if people, uh, have been, uh, are familiar with this distinction from other courses or not, but, um, um, anyway, if you're hearing about it for the first time now, maybe I should erase this and put it in somewhere else. So... Contemporary philosophy is mostly divided, mostly, into these two big schools, analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. Already from those names, you can tell that something funny is going on, right? Because if this, isn't a, this is a weird juxtaposition. Analytics seems to be something about method, right? Like analysis, whereas continental is the name of a place the continent of Europe, continental Europe. Um, um, but it's weirder than that because actually both of these schools, at least as I understand it, this is already controversial, both of these schools got started in Germany and Austria in the early 20th century, early to mid 20th century, like 20s and 30s basically. So, I mean, uh, what's the difference between them? Well, uh, at least, oh, wait, Ryan, do you have a hand up or is that just from before? Oh, um, I just have a question. You might yeah. this ready, but like, um, like around what time does uh, modern science is using it like start? Or what time period does it start to begin to become um, modern science? You know, around the late 16th, early 17th century, roughly speaking. The, you know, what's called the scientific revolution. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, right. So, like, at least now, you couldn't explain the difference between these two schools in terms of a disagreement over some point of doctrine or something like that. It's, it's something at the same time deeper than that, or, but it could also seem more superficial than that. It's, oops, what just happened? Wait, can you hear me? We can hear you. We just can't see you. Yeah, and I can't. All right, this will probably resolve itself. But let me see what happens if I. And I'll see. I think the problem is with the software, not hardware, unfortunately. Um, oh, something's better. There's still no video, but cursor's unfrozen.
There we go. <sighs> okay. <laughs> yes, the most suspense ever built, as someone said in the chat. Um, uh, except it's, it's not going to go well because I've lost my train of thought. Um, right, it's like it's kind of a difference of style is what you would first notice um, if you compare these two, like writing style. Um, uh, it's also uh, a difference of language, like analytic philosophy, although, as I just said, uh, at least the, the, the dominant school of it um, started in um, Germany and Austria and was written in German and the first things we're going to be reading in this course are translated from German. Um, uh, Post-World War II, basically uh, dominated English-speaking philosophy and only English-speaking philosophy. Whereas continental philosophy, at least initially, was the dominant form in French and German. Um, in, you know, other languages, it's more complicated, I guess. But as you probably know, those are the three most important modern European philosophical languages. Um, so uh, uh, I think, you know, since then, it's changed a little bit. Um, but I guess I would say... Um, to this day, philosophy departments in English-speaking countries are overwhelmingly analytic. And continental philosophy that's done in English is usually done in a literature department or at UCSC in the HISCON department um, or somewhere else like that. Um, uh, meanwhile, in, in Europe, you know, and Latin America and other places, analytic philosophy has kind of expanded. <laughs> um, but, you know, with it, also uh, publishing in English has expanded. <laughs> so, so analytic philosophy is basically now Anglophone philosophy. Um, and continental philosophy is... Um, it's more complicated, but it's basically French German philosophy or philosophy done in English, but not in a philosophy department. Um, so, uh, um, so those are some of the differences, but now there's another difference that's most relevant for this course, which is the attitude towards science. So analytic philosophers from the beginning uh, felt some kind of close connection to science and mathematics. Um, modern mathematical logic, the kind that's taught in Phil 9, was uh, adopted enthusiastically by the early analytic philosophers. It's never really gotten much interest from continental philosophers. Um, and... Um, um, and so, although both analytic philosophers and continental philosophers continue to think about science, I mean, based on what I've said, like, you can't really avoid that, doing science, in the, uh, doing philosophy in, a mo in the modern period. Um, and moreover, even though anal analytic philosophers don't always understand science that well, <laughs> Um, I mean, to begin with, I think these early people were definitely, you know, in some ways, they, they were not great mathematicians or scientists, but they were conversant with the latest developments in science and mathematics. Um, nowadays, that kind of connection to the latest developments in science and mathematics is usually found in specialties, really. But it's still true, I think, that analytic philosophers in general have a feeling that philosophy is more like, looks up to science and mathematics, whereas continental philosophers tend to have more of a feeling that philosophy is more like literature or um, connected to literature. These are all huge oversimplifications. I hope that's clear. But they're not terrible. I mean, they're, they're good enough. <laughs> and they're good enough to explain why there's a field called philosophy of science, and it's basically a subfield of analytic philosophy.
and um, um, based on what I was just saying about the origins of analytic philosophy, it should be clear that from the very beginning, this was one of the most important fields of analytic philosophy. Um, so these early people, the, the kind of, remember what I said before about how Aristotelians talked about various kinds of philosophical specialties but didn't usually do it. I mean, there were people here and there, right? Someone who was really only interested in logic and just wrote about that or whatever. But for the most part, you know, everyone worked on every area. <laughs> um, that really continued to be largely true in philosophy up through like the 1970s or 1980s. So, uh, I mean, again, I don't know how familiar you are with the state of the field now, but especially analytic philosophy, continental too to some extent, but especially analytic philosophy is hyper specialized these days. Um, so that wasn't true at first. So these people were going to read, were, felt free to write about everything. They didn't think that we're, they were, I'm a philosopher of science, so I don't get to write about, you know, ethics or whatever. Um, but they thought that the relationship to philosophy, between philosophy and science was central to doing philosophy correctly. So in fact, they, they said a lot about science and thereby along with everything else, uh, founded the, the, dis the specialized discipline of philosophy of science. Um, and as I said, since this split, according to me, happened in Germany and Austria in the 1920s and 30s, that's when it started. So if that's true, what we call philosophy of science, that's where and when it started. And so that's where and when this course starts. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to read um, things that were written in that early period and then see take things up through the um, basically early 1960s. That was kind of the classical period in which the um, discipline that we call philosophy of science got founded. Um, okay, other questions about that before I go on? Okay, so the next thing is to explain, maybe I should have pointed this out when I, when I was looking at the syllabus, but the next thing is to explain the way the course has been divided into two halves. And it's been divided into two halves because as I see it, there's um, basically two main traditions of analytic philosophy of science in this period. Um, now they both um, started around the same time and the people who started both of them were associated with each other. They were associated with something that's called the Vienna Circle. Are there two ends in Vienna? Yes. The Vienna Circle was a um, group of like-minded philosophers in Vienna, obviously, <laughs> um, in the late 20s and early 30s. Um, and uh, um, it was... It wasn't like an institute or something, but it was actually relatively formal in the sense that they had meetings and, you know, they like would have speakers in to present things to them. And they even wrote a manifesto at some point. <laughs> um, so, right, so there was this uh, group called the Vienna Circle. Um, 
It was actually founded by a guy named Moritz Schlick. Um, we're not going to be reading anything by Moritz Schlick, but um, but the most influential member of it was Rudolf Carnap. I mean, I guess, unless you count Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein was also associated with the Vienna Circle. He hated Carnap, and um, he didn't always get along that well with the others. Um, so anyway, the, the most uh, influential part of the Vienna Circle, person in the Vienna Circle proper, was Rudolf Carnap. That's the first um, author we're going to be reading. Um, and he had an associate who we're also going to be reading stuff from, who's also in the Vienna Circle, Otto Neurath. Um, and uh, these people founded a school called Logical Positivism. So it started um, especially with Carnap and Neurath in the Vienna Circle. But then there were later generations um, of logical positivists, um, both uh, uh, in Germany or Austria, but then afterwards in England and America. Um, um, and that's the beginning of one of these two traditions that, so that's going to be the first one we talk about. I, I'll say what the difference between them is in a second, but I want to add what the other tradition is. So the other tradition is um, so associated with the Vienna Circle, but not part of the Vienna Circle, and partly because he wasn't in Vienna, he was in Berlin. <laughs> but also for other reasons, was Karl Popper. Um, and Karl Popper basically started his own school. He certainly had a lot of things in common with the Vienna Circle philosophers, but there were also some important differences, including big differences of how he thought about science, so that's what we're going to be seeing. Um, and he sort of founded his own school. I don't, they don't have a name like Logical Positives. We just call them Popperians. <laughs> um, um, and so that's the second tradition we're going to be studying. And I mean, so we're going to start off with Carnap and Neurat on one hand, and and then the second part of the course will start with Popper. And then after that, we're going to read later responses that, that, um, that kind of, I mean, this is something that always happens in the history of philosophy, often happens in the history of philosophy. An important way of inheriting a tradition is to rebel against it, <laughs> right? So, um, so in other words, like Goodman and Quine, who we're going to be reading later in the first half of the course. I guess I shouldn't, I really, we should be reading the next thing. We'll actually work together. Goodman and Klein. Um, uh, Klein more than Goodman, but Goodman also basically uh, are critical of logical positivism and uh, want to, you know, replace it with something else. But that's what they're critical of. So the, right, so so their philosophical position is put in in reaction to the the tradition started by Carnap and Neurath. By tradition start, I mean it's not like I mean it's not like there's a long time in between of tradition, right? Quine actually you know visited Carnap when he was still in Europe when Quine was a young student um, when when Carnap was in Prague. Um, so, you know, they knew each other, it's, but in any case, it's that point, it's that Carnap point of view that Quine and Goodman are reacting against. And meanwhile, um, the main other person in the second half of the course, Thomas Kuhn, is, I will argue, is basically a response to Popper. Again, a critical response, but 
Um, so the, these people aren't really criticizing Popper. They're not really part. They're not really in conversation with him that much. And Kuhn, um, I'll, I'll argue, is not really engaging with this tradition. He's really criticizing Popper. Okay. Was there a special distaste from each side for the other? Someone has asked in the chat. Um, well, it depends who and when, but um, we'll see that Neurath in particular uh, is, uh, um, so between Popper and Kuhn, we're going to read some other responses to short, shorter responses to Popper. And one is a paper that Neurath wrote about Popper um, in German in, I guess, I don't know exactly what year, early 30s, I think, um, called Pseudo Rationalism of Falsification. And the whole moral of the paper is basically. Don't be deceived. Popper is not one of us. He's not truly a scientific philosopher. He belongs to the old, bad metaphysical philosophy. So that was some serious distaste, yes. Um, and uh, Hilary Putnam, who was one of my teachers, who um, we're going to read a couple things by. So he really he criticizes both sides, but uh, but I think he was he saw himself more as belonging to the Carnap side. I remember when I was in grad school once I met him in the hallway and he asked me what I was reading and I said, "Oh, I've been reading some Popper," and he was like, "No, no, 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 no." <laughs> So, yeah, there were, you know, but on the other hand, Carnap and Popper themselves actually got along okay with each other. They, you know, they, they tried to be charitable to each other or whatever. So, yeah, it depends which... Popper in general was a kind of difficult character. So, um, a lot of people had bad feelings in relation to him. Um, I guess that's as much as I can say about that now. Um, okay, so uh, so what's the difference between these two traditions? Well, they're both. I mean, they're both trying to answer that that big question that I posed at the beginning, right? What is it that makes science particularly successful? And they both give a similar answer up to to a point. Right? So first of all, they both emphasize that science is rational, that it's using particu a particularly rational method. Secondly, they both emphasize that science is empirical. Now you might think, well, of course, if you wanted to justify modern or explain what's good about modern science, you would emphasize that it's empirical. But the truth is that uh, rationalists looking at the rise of modern science said that the key idea was, uh, right, so there's like the empiricist Galileo. The empiricist Galileo is the one who goes out with a telescope and sees the moons of Jupiter and whatever, and that's what changes everything. But the rationalist Galileo is the one who says, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. That was the key insight. Right. So, I mean, so I guess you could say that, that, that both of these schools kind of combine both of those. Right. On the one hand, they both emphasize that what's important about science is that it's empirical and it's empirical through and through, so to speak. But uh, they also um, see some important role for the tools of modern mathematical logic in explaining why. Uh, this particular empirical activity is rational in the way it is. So up to that point, they both agree with each other. So they both use the same symbols and they both agree that science is empiric empiricist and so forth. Um, but they have different ways of explaining what is so special and rational about what scientists do. And so to explain what the difference is, I want to introduce, so I'm going to have to erase this. I hope that's not my presentation. That just means I'll have to write it um, 
I'm going to introduce a distinction that's going to keep coming up throughout the course. And I know from experience that a lot of people find it confusing, but I still don't know how to explain it better so that it won't be confusing, but I, I, I will keep emphasizing it and do my best. Um, so the distinction is between, um, this is probably the best way to write it, concepts. And under concepts, I'm going to write and relations. That's one side of the distinction. And the other side of the distinction is propositions. Or you could say statements. Proposition and statement in this context are both translations of the same German word, Satz. So uh, well, some of our translations will say proposition and some will say statement. Um, so what's the difference between concepts and propositions? I mean, I, tr I try to think why this is confusing. I think one reason it's confusing is that we have a normal way of using the word concept in English now. And it's not very precise. And, you know, and I mean, that's not a bad thing in and of itself, right? The use we have for it is not very precise. So like if you say, you know, if I say, hey, I've been busy lately, and you say, you have no concept. So like there's no reason for us to stop and wonder about exactly what a concept is, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's like uh, something you kind of have when you know about something or something like that, right? <laughs> but um, that's as far as we need to take it. Um, so that's fine, but the problem is that like we need this word or other words that have similar problems to draw this distinction that at least these philosophers thought, and I guess I agree, is really important. And so, um, and it's hard to explain what the, it's not, well, let me give examples. I think that's the best way to try to explain it, right? So like, here's a proposition. All roses are red. So it's, um, it's something that can be true or false. In fact, it's false, right? Not all roses are red. <laughs> but uh, it's something that can be true or false. It says something about something. And uh, it, can write, it can be rightly saying that about it, or it might be wrongly saying that about it. Because it has to say something about something, it has to have some pieces <laughs> that tell you what the something and the something are. And the pieces are the concepts. So in this case, the concepts are rose and red. Right? So like rose is not something that by itself can be true or false. If I, if I just say rose by itself, I haven't asserted anything. To assert something about it, I have to, at least often, I mean, this, although this is the traditional, like, this is how Aristotelians think about propositions, that they, they're, they're all like, all roses are red. There may be other more complicated or less complicated ways of saying something about something, but you have to add something to the concept, like another concept, in order to claim something about it. In this case, what I'm claiming about whatever is, right, it's like the concept rose is like a, um, it like presents something to you for consideration. And then in order to claim something about it, I bring, for example, another concept, red, and I say, you know, okay, whatever, whatever has just been presented, whatever falls under that concept, rose, I'm claiming this other concept, red, applies to it.
right? Or like, so here's another example. One is a natural number. Right, where the natural numbers are the numbers one, two, sometimes people include zero and sometimes they don't. But the natural numbers are one, two, three, four, like all those numbers, right? So um, one is a natural number. This is a proposition, it's either true or false. It's true. I guess it's necessarily true, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, you might, if you didn't have a lot of space to write, one things out, you might write it somewhat like this, right? You might use this letter N to stand for is a natural number and to write that one is a natural number, you would write N of one, N is, right, N one. So the concepts here, so is one a concept? I don't know, it's a name, I, let's, let me, let me not get into that because maybe it is and maybe it isn't, but natural number is a concept. By itself, natural number isn't true or false. You have to apply it to something. And then it either applies correctly or it applies incorrectly, right? So, you know, like, n of n two thirds is false because two thirds is not a natural number. And you could think of this concept as being like n of something, but we have to say what or else we don't get a proposition. And I'm looking at it that way because in the first reading, Carnap is going to spend a lot of time trying to explain that, that that's the way you should think about concepts following uh, Frege, basically. Um, okay, and finally, here's one other example. Every natural number has a successor. This is one of the axioms of uh, what's called piano arithmetic. Right? That um, every natural number has a successor, meaning for every natural number, there's, I mean, it actually has a unique successor, but I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it has a successor. Every natural number has a successor, meaning that for every natural number, there's one, there's a, at least one number that stands in this relation of being the number after it. We call it successor, right? So the successor of one is two, the successor of two is three, the successor of three is four, and so forth. Oh, someone has their hand raised. Yeah, I was just kind of wondering, you might not want to go into this because you didn't want to go into uh, if a number was a concept, but yeah. like for all roses are red, it's yes. like the R and the all, are those <laughs> also concepts? And then, then since propositions are true or false, is the truth and falsity, is that a concept that's like implicit in the proposition as well or what? Uh, um. So the, the short answer, and probably the best answer to think about it in this course, like reading Carnap and Popper and whatever, is that no, those, um, so first of all, the truth value is something that the proposition has, but it isn't part of the proposition. And second of all, that the proposition at least the way we write it. I haven't said whether these are mental entities or linguistic entities, right? Carnap's gonna actually say, um, and he's gonna say more clearly later on that they're really linguistic entities, that they're like words or something. But, but in any case, um, so the proposition or at least our expression of it or something has parts 
um, in the Middle Ages, these were called syncategorematic terms <laughs> that uh, don't stand for concepts. They just tell you how the concepts are related to each other, like R. So, I mean, I think that that's that's the short answer. The long answer is it's not that clear. Uh, you know, maybe they are, con I, but that's the short answer. Is that is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. I mean, and you can see why, right? Because because the, this rose, you know, again, it it's something that 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 things fall under. It's a classification of things, you know about which something can be true or false. It, it, it is a way of representing a certain kind of thing. It presents you with a certain kind of thing. And similarly with red, but the R, it does not really bring in something else. At least, again, it could be more complicated. When you're talking about um, Husserl and Heidegger and Quintano and other people in this course, uh, you know, uh, let alone if we went what farther afield than that, then it would it would become really complicated quickly. Um, but that's that's the short answer. That that's that that R is you know there isn't something that the concept the proposition isn't about three things: roses, red, and being. It's a bit, it's about roses and red. <laughs> Okay, so that was a good question. By the way, so I don't always notice these hands up right away because I'm looking at my notes and I'm looking at the board. You know, you feel free to just, and I do try to check the chat often, but sometimes I forget that. I don't see anything new in the chat. But feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question, and that's fine. Um, okay, so anyway, every natural number has a successor which you could write something like this. Again, if you didn't want, if you had, didn't want to use up all this space with words. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is actually shorter, but anyway. For all x, if x is a natural number, then there exists y such that y is the successor of x. This is supposed to be a y. <laughs> right, so. Um, so this is a little bit more complicated way of putting to, putting the parts together in order to get a proposition. Um, but also, in addition to this concept, natural number, it has this other. So you can call this a concept. And our authors sometimes will use concepts to mean everything that's here, this, and this. But sometimes they'll say it's a concept if it has one argument like this, but if it has more, they'll say it's a relation. So this is a relation, the successor relation. Right, and you can see why it's, whatever you call them, it's different from, oops, the focus is off now. And I've determined only over the years that the only way to get the webcam to refocus is to unplug it and plug it back in. Oops. Oh. Okay. Right. So um, whatever you call it, you can see why the, um, this is a little bit different from this, right? To, to get a proposition out of this, you only have to supply one thing. To get a proposition out of this, you have to supply two things and in a certain order, right? So it like takes ordered pairs of things. Because, you know, if y is the successor of x, then x is not the successor of y. So it's important what order they come in. So that's called a relation. Um, 
But on the other hand, you can see why I write it on this side rather than that side, because again, um, successor of just by itself is neither true nor false. I haven't said anything. I have to supply an ordered pair of things, and then you can tell me whether one is the success, the first one is the successor of the other, second one. Okay, all of that, I'm gonna, you know, when I'm, I think, I haven't done this before, but I think my next lecture is gonna be a little bit um, technical stuff heavy. Um, therefore, I'm gonna come back to this stuff again then. After that, I'm not going to talk about the technical details very much. Um, Carnap thinks they're really important. But uh, the way he tried to do it in the first book of Winter Reading, which is called the Aufbau, because from its German title, um, Der Logische Aufbau der Welt, the, the, but the translation is uh, logical construction of the world. Um, so uh, in the, the, the particular way Carnap tried to do it in the Aufbau, he himself later concluded wouldn't work and he changed a lot of things. So, um, so therefore it's like, and, and yet he still felt he was basically working on the same project. So I think it kind of, if you take a step back, you can say, well, the exact details, technical details, are interesting, but they're not essential to understanding what Carnap is doing. Having said that, I mean, you can't understand what he's saying at all without supplying some of them because he talks about them so much. So that's the balance I'm going to try to, to keep. Um, but so in any case, I will be talking about this more again, and, I, and definitely this distinction between concepts and propositions is going to keep coming up. So I hope it can become clear. And the reason I'm introducing it now right away is that the difference between Carnap and Popper, I think the fundamental difference is this. Carnap's answer to what makes science special is that science uses empirically meaningful terms or concepts. Right? So the idea is that, for example, a concept like rose is an empirically meaningful concept because I can tell whether something is a rose by, you know, um, looking at it or otherwise um, gathering empirical information about it. But uh, there are other concepts or purported concepts, like let's say monad. You know, Leibniz's concept monad. So, uh, um, and maybe some other even more important ones like God or something. But anyway, there's some concepts that, uh, or at least purported concepts, words that look like they should stand for concepts or be concepts. Anyway, there's something like that that doesn't um, include any empirical criteria for whether that thing is, is present or not, so to speak. So Carnap says, and in those cases, we don't know what we're talking about, it's, it's nonsense. So, um, so Carnap's analysis of what is right about science is that scientists have um, figured out how to use only empirically meaningful concepts and use them. Uh, so, so, so that's the basic step. And then they also, and this is where the tools of mathematical logic come in, know how to put them back together correctly so that the resulting proposition is still empirically meaningful. Um, so, right, so the, so the answer here is, Science uses meaningful concepts. Uh, 
And it's as opposed to what Carnap calls metaphysics. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't empirically meaningful, like forms of discourse that aren't empirically meaningful. Um, the, the, the one that Carnap likes to use as an example that he thinks is fine is lyric poetry. So he says, you know, the way we use language in lyric poetry, um, there's no question of whether what the poet says is empirically correct or not. They would be misunderstanding what the poem is for if you tried to take it that way, like to argue with it on those grounds or something. It's, it's, its purpose is to express an attitude or something, not to tell you facts about the world. But what metaphysics is, is something that looks like science, that, that, that seems like it's making assertions that you should agree with or disagree with, but it doesn't use empirically meaningful concepts, and so it's nonsense. And that's the distinction that Carnap wants to make. Between, and so modern science is this, and bad old philosophy is this, and good new philosophy is going to somehow um, find a place that is legitimate somehow on this side. And we'll talk about what that is later. Whereas Popper's answer is that science makes falsifiable statements. or I guess I should say propositions, but it's translated statements. Science uses falsifiable propositions, right? So Popper says, you know, it doesn't matter what concepts you use. And furthermore, he says that he agrees with Carnap that metaphysics contains em empirically untestable statements, but he says it's not nonsense. It's just, it's not science. But the problem isn't the concepts. Use whatever concepts you want. The point is you have to use them in such a way that, um, um, someone can show that you're wrong. Or really, you have to use them in such a way that you can show that they're wrong. And um, so this is, uh, again, it's a way of saying that it has to be empirical, but there, it results in a really different picture of how science works, right? Like here, the point is, we're going out with these concepts that we have criteria when they apply, and we're gathering evidence for our scientific theories by finding places that our concepts, that the criteria are met and our concepts apply. Popper is going to say there's no such thing as justifying a scientific theory by evidence. You get a theory in your mind, you believe it for some psychological reason, but what makes it rational is that you determine in advance that you'll be willing to give it up if it fails severe empirical tests. And the opponent on this side is what Popper calls pseudoscience. So again, Popper, like Carnap, says there's lots of things that aren't science but are fine. They're just not science, right? Carnap said that about lyric poetry. Popper says that about, for example, metaphysics. And he also says that about what he's doing himself in his book, which he calls methodology. He says, no, it's not science. But again, that's okay. But again, it's, it's just like on the Carnap side, really. Pseudoscience is something that looks like science, but isn't. And Popper's big examples, according to him, are going to be Freudian psychoanalysis and 20th century Marxism. Um, so, I mean, 
uh, without getting into whether he's right or that, about that or not, that his idea is that in both of those cases, the people are using the theory in such a way as to be determined never to give it up no matter what evidence comes in. It's a little, the, the strategy is a little bit different in the two cases, and, you know, but that's, so, I mean, I think, you know, he would agree probably that something like what we usually call pseudoscience, like astrology, he would probably agree that that's a pseudoscience. I think last time I, ha I taught this course, I used that example, and then I had a student who, like, did the horoscopes for all the people we were reading. <laughs> and, oh, um and made certain somewhat insightful comments about them based on where the moon was when they were born or whatever. I don't know. In any case, but his, but his main idea when he talks about pseudoscience is something that looks like a theory that it would be rational to believe, only you realize when you look into it that it's not rational because the people who believe it aren't willing to give it up in the face of evidence. Okay, uh, there were a f so just like last time, I've, I've used up all the time. In fact, I think I went even longer. I got to even less this time than I did last time I gave this lecture. Um, but uh, I was going to say some introductory things about Carnap, but I guess I'll say them next time after I've read some Carnap. And um, Yeah, there's only one minute left. I don't think there's time to, to start any new subject. So, uh, oh, is there a question here? Oh, how will we be able to find the, the recorded lectures for asynchronous lecture watch, watching? So as I said at the beginning, maybe you weren't here yet. I'm going to put them up on YouTube. There's going to be a YouTube playlist. Um, it won't go up instantly. It takes a little while to process it and get it uploaded and whatever. And sometimes I'm tired and I don't do it till the next morning. <laughs> but it should be up pretty quickly. Um, and um, and there will be links to that on the online syllabus. If you can't find the online syllabus, there's a link to the online syllabus in the Canvas page, which you can find. You could also probably Google Abe Stone philosophy courses, you know, find my courses page, whatever. Um, so there will be, once the playlist is created, there will be a link to the playlist there. That is after I upload tonight's lecture. And where can we find the link to the first scanned reading? So the first reading is from one of the required texts for the course. So uh, hopefully you've managed to acquire that book or somehow get access to it, whether it's legitimately or not. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, uh, the scanned readings will be up in Canvas, and they will, and the. There will be links from the syllabus once I put them up. I just haven't done that yet. And I, first, I think the first reading like that is not for a couple of weeks at least. Okay. Is that... Could I provide a scanned version of the book? I don't think I can provide a scanned version of the whole book because it's under a copyright. Um, so... Uh, I think it would be illegal for me to provide a scanned version of the book. Um, uh, uh, it is on reserve at McHenry. Um, you can uh, buy it from Amazon or through the Baytree bookstore and it will arrive quickly. Um, you can probably find a pirated version somewhere. Not that I would uh, recommend that you do that or anything <laughs> for educational uses yeah I, I understand that but I think putting up a whole book is, is, is not fair use even for that um, 
Yes, there is. <laughs> there is such a site that has just been mentioned. Just the part, okay, do I have a scanned version? I might have to scan it myself page by page. Uh, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right, but uh, but you should try to get access to it some other way because I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm going to have time to do that. Um, is there? Is it because the bookstore has switched systems or something that it wasn't clear what the required tests for the course were going to be? Or I don't know. Anyway, uh, like I'll if if I already have a PDF of this part somewhere, maybe I'll put it up. Uh, I don't know that I have time to go scan in all the pages. I hope you can find it somehow, though. Yeah, I understand that that's, I mean, I, I understand that some people might not be able to make it to the physical library for various reasons. Um, but uh, I think Ryan is giving you good advice. Or I don't know if it's good, but anyway, useful advice. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I mean, I I haven't looked for it there, but <laughs> I'm gonna guess. All right. Um, so good luck with that, and you know, um, if you have to catch up a little bit later, I think it won't be the end of the world. All right, uh, we're past, well past the end of time now, so uh, I will see you all on Thursday. Okay, bye.